Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We've got another interesting show for you this evening on the Billy Meyer case. And I want to bring on my guest right away, Daniel Cooper. Daniel, how are you this evening? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, we chatted a little bit last night, um, and just before the show, I wanted to tell you a little about the program before I brought you on, and I forgot to ask you, I don't think I asked you what part of Canada you're living in. Way up near Alaska, so oh, not is that far right? from, uh, yes, <laughs> up in the Yukon, so if uh, people are wanting to visit, they got to pay the money to get here, I guess. <laughs> now, <clears throat> have you lived there your whole life, or what? Yeah, born and raised here, so, and... You never know why, but, you know, you just figure out things and, and live your life. So <laughs> I guess uh, I guess you really know what winter's like then, right? Yeah, yeah, we sure do up here. It's, we've got snow already, but uh, still a pretty warm year for supposedly what's supposed to be a cold year. So not, uh, not that impressed yet. We've had minus 40s in September before, Celsius. So we're uh, pretty warm today. <laughs> So what would minus 40 Celsius be in Fahrenheit, do you know? Uh, actually, I think they're pretty close together at that point. About I think that. minus 35, <laughs> minus 30, yeah, minus 35 Celsius and Fahrenheit, are, I think, are the same. And then it kind of goes wonky after that, so I'm not sure exactly. But, um, yeah, it's pretty pretty chilly anyway. <laughs> so when did you when did you first get interested in the Meyer information? Oh, that's a long story, man. I I kind of knew about it when I was a kid, but, you know, like it's one of those things where, you're, you know, people, nobody ever told me about it or anything, and I didn't have any books about it or anything like that. And I was just thinking and thinking and thinking over the years, and I just kind of figured that this case has to exist. And yeah, I just did a whole pile of calculations over the years, and before high school was out, I was finished with that framework. And ended up being kind of a testing framework and it would be used later on when I actually did look for other UFO cases and because I knew a lot of them were set up of course by intelligence agencies and all this kind of garbage so I figured well you need a filter system you know if you're going to find something like this which is very much hidden for obvious reasons <laughs> so so that's what I did and it seems to have worked I got this uh I got his birth year right, and I got a few other things right about the time and place that it came public, which is Switzerland, 1975. And, and well, then, yeah, let, in 2008, me, I think it was, I, I found it. Let me back you up a little bit, because I'm not familiar with these calculations. What do you mean you did a whole yeah, bunch of calculations? Well, I haven't released them yet. Um, I've been working with them with uh, on them with Patrick Cheneau at the at the... Uh, at the center in Switzerland there. And uh, at first I wasn't sure, you know, because it wasn't really anything, you know, like you have an experience and sometimes it's really difficult to share that experience with other people. So at first I, I didn't really think anything of it uh, to bring it to other people at the center or anything like that because, you know, they meet crazy people all the time and kind of, you know, going to get blown out the other side of the engine sometimes too or whatever you know it's it's uh i just kind of wanted to keep my head low and just you know learn and see what i could figure out and all that kind of stuff but yeah so, no, it was just uh basic basic uh, probability stuff so nothing too fancy but it worked <laughs> so so well you said you were working with there? patrick chanel patrick is he the leader of figu no, no, he's uh, just one of the members there at okay. uh, at the center. Yeah, one of the one of the friends. So he's a friend of mine now, and we're I don't know. He I guess he was quite impressed with the uh, with what I had at the beginning there, which was sort of a short draft. And uh, I don't know. I didn't really have the confidence to bring it there at first, and and I I shared it with uh, another character uh, from Brazil who does nice analyses of 
of uh, whatever, the wedding cake UFO and all this kind of stuff uh, with Chris Locke oh. and, and so forth. Um, yeah, so, so I brought it up with Raul Zahi. I don't know if you know that name, but... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Raul Zahi. Anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I think exactly. I had him on the show. How you how you doing? Uh, oh, I, yeah, I think I had him on the show once. Um, so these are things you probably don't want to talk about too much because they're not officially released yet? Ah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, kind of yes and no. I mean, it's it's obviously interesting and, and so on to some people, but I don't know. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that's better off just read it, you know, for yourself kind of thing. And, you know, what most people do with Figu stuff, they just kind of read it on their own and, and that sort of thing. But, I mean, I, I don't care. If you want to ask about it, you can, but it's uh like i say it's not very complex stuff it's uh it's pretty simple actually and that's why it worked <laughs> so well we won't spend too much time on it but i'm still not understanding what you're calculating here what kind of things were you calculating oh basically you know i was trying to figure out where and when the case would come public you know if if these are intelligent people that are bringing this forward then they would obviously be really really strategic in their sort of I considered it like a giant chess game, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to release this kind of information and not get squashed out by certain power interests and so on and so forth. And also to make it so that it's the most um, useful time. So right before the computer age, of course, right before the internet age, you know, and then people can sort of start deciphering this stuff for themselves and disseminating it beyond, you know, control of governments and power groups and all this kind of garbage. And, um, yeah, and so, but, you know, basic stuff, like, you know, as we all know that Switzerland is a neutral political uh, country, and, um, you know, so neutral, uh, political neutrality certainly plays a big role in, in where it would be uh, coming public, but a lot of people like Einstein and so on spend a lot of time in Switzerland, and uh, that's where they have mm-hmm. the big CERN, you know, the big uh, Hadron Collider, and you know, there's just a lot of public support for science there and stuff like that, and and um, the culture is very hardworking. It's a bit like Japan, I would say, in some respect, and um, because they don't have a you know um, resource-based economy, it's more of a, a manufacturing-based economy because it's such a tiny country. So if they're going to stay competitive economically in the world, they have to do something else besides just digging oil out of the ground and stuff like that, like we do in Canada. So. Stuff like that. I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing really complicated. But you know, um, yeah. And of course, geographically, it plays, plays a big role because you know b- both world wars happen in, in Europe for a reason. It's because it's the easiest place to get to from any part of the world. So if you're in Australia, it's very difficult for you to get to Canada, but it's much easier to get to Switzerland. Well, the same would be could be said about a Canadian going to Switzerland versus going to Australia. So, and of course the Southern hemisphere, most, mostly apart from Australia is very much in turmoil and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of poverty and very little stability and so forth. So it's, I don't know, just point after point, it just kind of everything pointed to Switzerland. I was like, okay, so that's great. And then we just work out the year with uh, with technologies, you know, technological history. We know when the first personal computer came out and, and so on. So around 1980, 1982, stuff like that. And uh, he had people like George Lucas making Star Wars, right? So um, mm-hmm. you get uh, – I was really into that when I was a kid, right? So I, I would watch his uh, explanations before because I had the VHS tapes, you know, of the special editions, you know, <laughs> from – because he redid them in the mid 1990s, I guess it was, um, with computer technology, right, and stuff that he couldn't do even with record-breaking budgets, film budgets at the time in the 1970s and 80s, he still couldn't do those things, um, and so that's why he wanted to retouch them up with computer technology in the mid 1990s, and so he explained very, very clearly what you can and cannot do with film photography versus with. Photoshop and stuff like that, so which didn't come into existence really until the 1990s, and it still cost millions of dollars to produce. So if somebody really wanted to make a case like this public and really make, you know, the most uh, controversy, or not controversy, but what's the word, uh, the most 
waves, I guess, would be to bring it out before personal computers came out and uh, to do the mm-hmm. film photography. You can just tell so much more <laughs> with film photography. It's much harder to fake anything, especially if you're an amateur like Billy Meyer was. So, and, uh, yeah. The, uh, I don't know. This was, of that's, course, that's a very lot of things. Yeah. Sorry? I, I, I'm just saying that this is very interesting. So you looked at the case as a whole and then and analyzed certain variables like uh, the time when it became public and uh, the, the geographical location that it occurred at. And, and you, did you use statistics or mathematics to, to um, verify things? or basically, basically what I did was I just took things in my mind that would be at least 95% or more probable of being true. And so it's not really hard to do. I mean, everyone can check, you know, if Switzerland is political neutral, neutral, uh, politically neutral. Everyone can check the geographic location and tell, you know, where, you know, what's going on in the southern hemisphere and blah blah blah, and what's going on in Europe. And everyone can tell that, you know, Switzerland is really advanced uh, as far as their education. Everyone can read and write, and everyone has a scientific, basic scientific understanding in that culture. And there's a lot of support for it there, of course, with the the Hadron Collider and stuff, which is the biggest physics machine in the world at this point. I don't know if the Chinese have come past that now, but uh, anyway, but Switzerland certainly um, has a history of very good support in that direction. Everyone can check, you know, when the first personal computer came out, all this stuff. Like, it's not, it's not, it's not a secret. None of this stuff is a secret. So you just put it all together and then it just kind of comes out as, well, yeah, Switzerland 1975 would be the best, really the best time, I think, to do it. Especially given what happened also before 1975, because this guy would have had to have gone through the Middle East to learn about the religions and the the most difficult political frictions and stuff and so on and so forth uh, you know, in a time when he could walk through the Middle East and not, you know, get killed not feeling it. So in exactly. 1960. Yeah, <laughs> you couldn't do that today, great. could you? <laughs> no, you couldn't. So, so that plays a huge role. Also, just the fact that the guy was born, you know, right around the World War II, and he got to see the tail end of it. You know, that that probably as a child would be the most uh, grounding thing that a person could see when things degenerate to such a point for such a mission like this. You know man, like to see that result and to actually see it for yourself as a boy, you know, I mean, he talks about that a little bit too in his, in his contacts. And I thought, well, yeah, of course he'd want to be born so that you can actually see that a little bit before you start educating the kid. Right. So I don't know, all this stuff just kind of played in together. I even had the guy's birthday down to, to the year, not, not to the month or anything, but just to the year 1937 because of the Chinese calendar with the ox, same year that uh, George Carlin, Carlin was born. And that's not too much of a surprise, given what he was into as well. And uh, opening people's minds and, you know, that sort of thing and so on. So anyway, so it's, uh, but the Chinese calendar thing wasn't really something that I could bank on as much as, you know, the other stuff. But it was just a point of interest for me. And I just figured, well, it might be 1937. So I just kind of went with that. It wasn't really anything that I could, you know, it wasn't. It didn't have the same level of probability as all the, all the other stuff. So it wasn't something that I really. But it was all theoretical on my part, anyways, at the time, because I didn't discover it until nine years after I finished the the the, uh, the framework, right? Okay, let me so let I me just try to get a picture of what you're saying here, because uh, we're getting a lot of information, and I'm trying to parse yeah. it. And it's very <laughs> impressive, by the way. This is very impressive because what I think you're saying is that there has to be a superior intelligence that planned these contacts, that planned the Uh location, that planned the date, planned all these details. Is this what you're trying to say? Yeah, of course. If they're superior chess players compared to us, which of course they would be, then yeah, they would have to to pick a very intelligently uh, picked, I guess, or they would have to pick a very intelligent, I don't know, intelligently placed time and place to do it. It's just most it's just basic strategy, right? So um, that's huge. Yeah. I've I've never looked at it from that perspective. 
Well, that's, that, yeah, that's the weird thing. Like, I, I, I didn't think about that much. Like, I just thought everyone thought about these things because they're so simple, right? Like, I just thought, oh, okay, well, I'm a kid, you know, I'm an idiot, and then nobody listens to me, right? And why, you know, why would anybody? <laughs> so, you know, and that's just kind of the way it went. And then I found the case, and I thought, well, great. So it doesn't serve me any purpose anymore, and I didn't talk about it for years. So then I just realized that when I brought it up in conversation in certain circles, it did impress them and I thought oh that's interesting because it's so simple <laughs> so I don't know but uh, well, yeah, I decided he, to, uh, you know. even the point you brought up about it had to be brought out just before Photoshop or otherwise it could have been easily discredited or people would have at least tried to discredit it yeah exactly I was just talking actually to uh, my old saxophone teacher and he's a video uh, video editor now, and he's been doing that for oh, 20 or 30 years. I don't know what, how long, but a long time. And his basement's just filled to the brim with equipment and everything else. And I just brought this up the other day because we were just saying hi, and and uh, he was like, "Yeah, of course." He he even he even he took the words right out of my mouth. I didn't even have to say anything about film photography and how yeah, you can't fake stuff, whereas you can with pixels and all this kind of garbage. I didn't even have to say. He just said it right for me. So it was so, I don't know. It's nice to hear it from from people like that. And Raul Zalhi, of course, was very impressed with that idea as well. So, of course, that's his main focus with these his, his analyses with Chris Locke and so on too, right? So, so yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. It, what's interesting about what you're saying is it verifies the Meyer case in terms of logic that people can see, uh, real common sense. And what's different about that than than kind of what I do or or what pulled me to the case is, like, the way I verified it for me was, like, getting into the details of the case. So it's just, when you look at it from the way you have, it's overwhelmingly obvious that this was all yeah. planned ahead of time. Right. Well, it was really funny because my uncle, or whatever, he told me about this UFO case. And he said he was the most, it was the most impressive UFO, UFO case he'd ever seen and whatever he saw it on 1989 or something on TV. And, and, um, and he told me, yeah, it was in Switzerland. And I thought, oh, that kind of got my interest, right? Because, of course, Switzerland in 1975. So I checked it out. Otherwise, if it wasn't, you know, I would have just ignored it and I'd say whatever. So I, but I checked it out and that was the, the first contact uh, documentary, I guess, with uh, uh, Jim Dilatoso and all those guys. Right. And um, it was 1975. They said they started the contacts. I was like, oh, well, this might be the case that I'm looking for. So I spent another three months just going through different stuff. And, and yeah, sure enough, it was. I was very happy to find it finally because <laughs> it was... Uh, it was painful to have all this stuff in my brain and nowhere to go with it, you know, So for so many mm-hmm. years. So <laughs> I was getting to you a know, point there where I was like, oh, geez. So. The Meyer information, it's had a tremendous impact on my life. And I say that the Meyer information answers all the big questions in life. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Would you agree with that? I would say it certainly answers a lot. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, of course, we have to do our own work and, and figure things out for ourselves, no matter what, you know, what answers we're given at the back of the math book, so to speak. But, you know, <laughs> like, if, you know, we have we still have to come up to our own answers and understand things, you know, but I, I, I'm sure. thoroughly impressed, of course, naturally. I mean, I had a lot of stuff in my calculations about reincarnation and, you know, stuff like that, too, because I had a lot of difficulties grasping life the way it is on this crazy planet as it is <laughs> these days and uh i didn't really want to stick around for what would i know would be a very difficult lifetime so but i found a way out of that by, by realizing that we're probably coming back on this <clears throat> planet and uh in some later lifetime and that we actually that would give us a lot of motivation to uh to really try to make things better in this lifetime that we have and this opportunity that we have to learn and and to grow in this in this life so it's it, yeah i don't know it's it's nice to be able to read the information from the point of view that i have but not everybody has that point of view and that's okay and you know what? everyone has to do their own work and that's 
totally what this is all about. And people, I, I don't know. It's it's totally up to everybody on their own to to do their own thinking and and so on. So and that's the way it should be. I'm I'm so glad nobody shoved this down my throat when I was when I was thinking about this stuff because it really helped me to really really understand maybe where they would be coming from from a like as you say from a logical point of view and um like when so, i see some of the conversations people have you know just trying to shove it down people's throats i'm just shaking my head and like oh man i would not have wanted that when somebody when i was looking for this stuff i would mm-hmm. have just wanted to discover it myself right so yeah mm. i don't know so i think so, they're actually quite right when they say don't proselytize and all that kind of stuff it's it's true don't <laughs> it doesn't help <laughs> So, but it's tempting to want to talk about it with people, and then you always kick yourself in the end. So, <laughs> um, so which of Billy's books have you read? Oh gosh, I've got all of the English translations so far, and uh, some of the spiritual stuff, and uh, many, many of the contacts and so on too. So, when uh, when Billy started talking about the Drew on ship or whatever from the photos that I took I I actually did know what he was talking about because I remember reading that contact and so on so um whereas it seems like a lot of people don't remember that which is interesting so let me so let me try to let me try to set the stage here then for the listeners here what you're talking about are these druin human ETs from the Knoll system it's Contact Report 184, among others, that talk about it. Uh, this system that these ETs are from is 3.1 million light years away. And these druids, they've been appearing in the skies of Earth without any cloaking on their ships. And one of the most recent sightings that I'm aware of occurred in 2001 in Contact 311. And these druids they they didn't protect themselves from you, view. They deliberately opened their view protection screen towards uh, a fellow named Freddie Crop, which I guess is one of the people at Figo, I'm, I'm thinking. And he yeah, photographed he a ship of the Druins in 2001 on August 11th. And it was photographed near the, the mountain called the Brighthorn in the Bernese Alps in southern Switzerland. But uh, Daniel, you also photographed one of their ships. Is that true? Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, I <laughs> I was just at the center, of course, and and just had a nice, lovely dinner in the kitchen. And Eva was showing me some nice artwork that the Swiss people used to make with scissors before they had TV, scissors and paper, whatever. It was lovely stuff. If you get a chance, check it out. Um, but, um, yeah, after that, I went outside and looked up at the sky. I was just on my way to the tent to read a bit and, and it was still bright daylight and six in the evening. So it was a beautiful blue sky and the sun was up still and so on. And, and, uh, but uh, yeah, I looked up and between two trees, there was this bright light and I thought, Hmm, that's interesting. But the closer I looked at it, the weirder it got because it kept changing shapes and colors and just, it looked like a a nebula of some kind and that's exactly what they described in the 1983 contact uh contact report sorry about about seeing the, the ship for the first time and uh yeah so i thought okay I, I didn't remember that at the time when i looked at this thing i just thought that's weird and it, it was stationary it wasn't moving at all and uh it was pretty much 45 degrees up angle uh, up the hill, I was kind of at the bottom of this hill and looking up, and the, between two trees you could see it. So it was right above, almost over the center, kind of. And, and uh, so I wondered if I had time to go and grab my camera. I stood there for about a minute, I guess, just looking at this thing, mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to miss it, so mm-hmm. I figured, well, maybe it's not going anywhere. So maybe, uh, maybe if I go to my tent, which is about 50 meters away, I can grab my camera. And I had a 38 time zoom um on the camera uh and so on so it's a great great I've, a great zoom i've used it for sheep scoping uh sheep scoping uh trips and stuff like that the weeks before and it's very very useful as a as a spotting scope and so on um past 40 uh past 40 uh 40 times zoom you pretty much only get uh 
the rays from the sun and stuff. So you can't, it just distorts the view and you can't see anything past that point really. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I had enough time to get it out and, uh, I, st- I stood there below the hill and, and, uh, got between another couple trees and started clicking shots and, and, uh, and it was pretty much stationary the whole time. And then it would move very slightly and then it would stop and then it would stay there for like a minute or two and then it would move really slowly. And then eventually it just kind of went over the hill and I didn't see it anymore. And I figured, well, I've got a whole pile of pictures here now. So, <laughs> so, and you know, going up the hill wouldn't have really helped much because uh, there was a bunch of trees in the way anyway. So I figured, okay, well, I'll just see maybe what Billy thinks about this. And, and, um, so I went back to the house real quick and asked Eva in my shaky German, is Billy around? Because <laughs> I think I was a foe. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure, but um, but um, like I've taken clear pictures with this camera of jets and paragliders and all kinds of stuff, even geese flying, you know, a thousand feet up, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, like usually I can take pictures like that with no effort and they're perfectly clear and and i don't even need a a stand or anything like that so um it's a great camera and uh so i brought in the the pictures on the computer and billy sat down and we started to look at them and i blew them up on the screen and took a few screenshots and uh yeah so we managed to to look through that and we went over it throughout the evening and a few other other people there too were kind of interested in what was going on and Billy kind of eventually realized hey yeah this actually looks exactly like this Juon ship that he saw in 1983 I guess with the other guys through his binoculars and he didn't have a camera at the time and uh, but the description was exactly it's like a light pink bright nebula that was constantly moving and uh, yeah it was, it was it, like his description too is that it was about five times the size of Venus, and uh, that's exactly what I saw too. So yeah, it was it was kind of a nice little corroboration of his his stuff. Like I don't expect that to be used as evidence for anything, because of course we're in the Photoshop age now. But it's still fun, and for anybody who's interested in that sort of thing, well, there you go. You know, sometimes you get to see stuff and have your camera handy at least, and whatever. <laughs> So you saw the ship in broad daylight, correct? Yes, yeah. It was about 6.08 p.m., I guess. That was the time stamp on the on the pictures. Yeah. And yeah. and what year was this? Oh, it was just in September, this last September. Really? So I was just, Recently? Yeah. It was, yeah, I was just there in 2016 here in September. Well, that's and, huge uh, because that means these guys are still showing up. And still yeah. appearing relatively, I mean, it's almost in our atmosphere. I guess it was in our atmosphere, right? Yeah, I guess Billy's uh, sort of estimate was about 35,000 meters uh, away when he saw it, and um, mm-hmm. 35,000 meters high. And uh, and I guess um, whoever it was, Toledo or something, confirmed that yeah, that that was the case or something. So and that's kind of what it looked like to me. I, I mean, I see the jets going by with the, you know, the whatever the uh, the contrails and all the stuff and the ones that were flying that get full altitude and so on and so forth. You can see all those going by and so on and so forth and and uh, around this thing and and then this thing was just sitting there like what the heck and it looked really far away. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> So I guess yeah, they're still they're still they're still around, you know, doing whatever they're doing. But apparently, did those you, ones are not in contact with Billy. So. Did you Sorry? sense an did you sense an intelligence from the ship when you were focused on it? Oh yeah, I mean you know the fact that it was standing still and uh, and then it would move ever so slowly and then it would stand still again. You know that's not something you get out of even a paraglider or anything like that, or, you know, a cloud, or, <laughs> um, you know, it was way too bright and much too small and whatever to, to, to be any of those things. And so, cause I've seen a million paragliders in Switzerland and I've seen a million air balloons and a million planes and a million this and that. So, I mean, I've been to Switzerland quite a few times just on holidays and apparently the paragliders don't fly around there anyway. There's no mountains in that area. So it's not really, um, I guess they have their designated areas where they they go. So, but I mean, like I say, I've seen them really high up, and they're always moving, and they're always, you know, they're never bright like that. And 
whatever. So it's just on and on it goes, and and the camera zoom certainly bears that out because it was nothing, anything close to what those things would be. I took actually a picture on the way home on when I was on the plane of another jet in the sky, and it was far, far away. But even through the the window of the the window of the airplane and the you know through the atmosphere and all the stuff you know that was in the clouds and so on you could still see the plane and that it was a plane and so on and so forth with the contrail in the back and on and on so i mean uh, it's a very good camera for that and uh so if it was anything <laughs> different it would have certainly shown up but it wasn't. have it, have it, you it, published different. have you published these photos on the web at all no, not really. I I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to talk to... Um, I'm making a little write-up about it. For Billy asked me to do that. so and I, I'm just kind of hung up on the German aspect at the moment, so I have to translate what I wrote. <laughs> so it's a nice little exercise for that. And uh, it's my first little German article, I suppose. <laughs> oh, so he wants you to write an article on it in German. Yeah, yeah. So I got the English tough. one already. That's not yeah. easy. <laughs> That's uh, that's right, <laughs> but it's a good exercise. I've been learning German, so it's it's a nice uh, nice thing to do. Actually, I just absolutely love the language and learning the language, and I can just feel so I don't know, just happy after I work on it on my Rosetta Stone program and all that kind of stuff. It's just a very nice thing to do. But, uh, have you have you yeah. ever listened Have you ever listened to Michael Udebrock of Figu Canada at all? I've been in contact with him a little bit, and uh, and his wife as well. And um, um, but I, I guess there was one uh, thing that I've been meaning to watch about his uh, presentation with reincarnation or something. Yeah. And um, very good. And, very good. Yeah, I, uh, I, I guess I I clicked on it on on Facebook at one time, and uh, I wanted to watch it. I just kind of tucked it away for later, and I never got around to it. So. So, oh, yeah, you'll definitely... like it. You'll like it. That's a very good, very, very good. Uh, I, I love that film. He's done a great job on that. He's done a very good. Yeah. Now, you, you, go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't Sounds like he has a good reputation for explaining things. Yeah, I was just going to say that's all, but yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Now, you mentioned, um, and I and I don't pronounce her name right. Now, this is this is one of the ladies that Billy has had contact with, she, Talda, maybe? She's a female from the... Li- How do you pronounce it? I, I don't know, just Talida, but I... Talida, Talida. So the J <laughs> is an I sound. Talita. I guess. I'm, okay. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah. <laughs> she's, a, she's a female from the Lyra system, uh, she took over for Pata and Quetzal because they had to leave for a while. I guess the, there was a lot of trouble with the people there in Switzerland with his group. And they they left her in charge. And uh, to me, she seemed like the kind of person that would not tolerate anything that didn't go according to plan. She right. seemed a little, do- a little dogmatic, a little stern. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I guess when you when you when you see things in a certain way and then thought them through well enough, like two plus two equals four, and well, let's just move on, you know. <laughs> For them, that's kind of maybe a higher level of that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's so funny about that? Uh, I, you know, I've been told by people that, you know, you don't uh, give enough respect to people who who maybe haven't thought about things as much as you do. Uh, I just found that very funny. Cause can, now, can you imagine what these extraterrestrials who, you know, I don't know what their IQ is, 300 or whatever, and they've thought through everything <laughs> backwards and forwards, and us goofy yeah. Earth humans come along, and, uh, you know, we don't, we're not precise. We just kind of do things, you know, that we feel like doing, whatever. Right. And they don't tolerate right. that, do they? They don't tolerate that. So go ahead, continue. <laughs> No, no, I, I totally agree. I think, um, I mean, to a point, I mean, I think it's just, in, in 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 some ways, I think they probably encourage creativity more, but they also just have far greater understanding of how things actually work. So, yeah, of course, they wouldn't tolerate, you know, 
some idiot that goes around and killing a bunch of people or, you know, wastes his life on drugs and all this kind of garbage and whatever, you know, like, yeah, you know, there's some things that they're kind of over, <laughs> I would say, but, okay. you know, like, we just, we just have to take it as it comes. And I mean, there's a lot of things that I wouldn't tolerate in my life either, but people do what they do and I say everyone's on their own path and that's totally okay and that's the way it should be right now and and uh you know so a big transition going on right now into into this age of knowledge which is very as Michael Horn points out very uncomfortable for people and uh who've been so reliant on on beliefs and so forth so I think it's yeah I think you know let people figure it out themselves do you you talk about the Meyer information becoming public? Do you think it's public now? Well, it's out in the public. I mean, before 1975, there was no real public knowledge about it. Um, Billy was pretty much keeping it to himself um, at that point, and so up to that point, I mean, and uh, I mean, not not with you know excluding the few people that he was around but that's just a few of his friends that's not really public so i would say yeah more or less i mean it's sort certainly uh, made the news headlines for a while and then um people can research it as much as they want on the internet and all this kind of stuff so in that sense it's public but yeah it's hard to find <laughs> And the UFO, uh, the UFO industry sure makes sure of that. You know, they don't want people to find it, so they make these dog and pony shows, as Michael Horn calls them, do. And I, that's why I made the framework. That's why I made the testing framework, the calculations, is to get through all that garbage. I didn't need it. It was such a waste of time. You know, you, you hear about so these ex CIA guys or whatever. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You call this a testing framework? Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Oh, well, it's just what I called it at the time because I didn't didn't know for sure if this case existed. It was just very high probability based on what I was finding. But um, when I did look through other UFO cases and so on and so forth, this would be kind of a filter system for me in terms of actually um, finding this particular case because, like I say, it's hard to find, and they don't make it easy to find for a reason, <laughs> because a lot of people want to stay in power. And they can't do that when people are figuring things out for themselves. So, just, yeah. So, did you did you build your, your framework, your system, before you discovered the Meyer case? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I was done in, I think it was 16 years old. I finished it, and, um, and then I, fig- I found it in 2008 in December. Um, wow! So. You you only discovered the case in 2008. That's incredible. Yeah. And you built yeah. this system. You had the system. I mean, that's very impressive, man. I'm impressed uh, that you were able thing. to. It was really annoying at the time. <laughs> to really, annoying. To stress that. Yeah, because Why? I was, was totally on my own. <laughs> I was I was completely on my own. Like you know, there was people all over. You know, I was. I couldn't talk to anybody about it, right? Like, it was totally theoretical, first of all, on my part at the time. And most of the people around me were quite, you know, religious or whatever, you know, tied into the materialistic framework in some way that, you know, they couldn't uh, change their mind about certain things or or whatever. So at the time, I just felt so totally, 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 totally alone. Like, that was what I where I was at in my life and so can I, that's let's, why I let's stop there let's I, I'm sorry to interrupt you again but yeah. you run such a good point is that you felt totally alone I experienced the same thing when I first <laughs> I discovered the Meyer case uh, I was totally alone I was I was going over this going oh my goodness this is incredible <laughs> And then you go to the UFO world with it, you know, and they they'll <laughs> attack you and shred you to pieces. Oh. And they hate yeah. you, and it's like, oh. mm-hmm. but I went through that. Mm-hmm. I went through that aloneness period. So maybe that's a principle, is what I'm trying to say, is everyone that comes yeah. to this case has to kind of come to it alone. They do. They really do. You can't force it down people's throats. You can't. It doesn't work. People have to come to it on their 
complete own. Like when I was, when I mean I found this case alone, like I mean nobody ever told me about it. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Like I went to a UFO conference once here and nobody ever talked about that. I mean, that was the one thing they didn't talk about. It was, uh, what's his name? Uh, Friedman. What's his, what's his name? Uh, Stan. Stan Friedman. Yeah. Right. And that guy was there and there was a bunch of whatever. And it was just, you know, talking about blah, 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 whatever. Roswell. And, yeah, it's interesting. But you can see there's something going on. But you can also see that they're hiding something. It was quite obvious. So for trying to keep uh, certain geopolitical interests alive, you know, certain paradigms from collapsing. So I, I could see that there was the hand of the government in a lot of these UFO groups, and uh, a lot of them were government funded. And I was like, well, okay, that's kind of a dead giveaway. I mean, I don't know. It just, yeah. Yeah, you do feel totally alone. when when. Well, that... the other thing with the other cases is what you can never get much deeper than the surface because there's really nothing past the surface. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there is nothing there. That's that's what I kept finding, and that's why I was like, man, this is not going to help. <laughs> not going to go to these. <laughs> this not going to go to these. Uh, you have, no, what, not what? at all. Like, yeah, some, <laughs> some CIA, ex CIA, whatever, blah 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 guy is talking about it. Well, yeah, great. And he's probably still being paid by the same people. You know, like he's probably still trying to steer the conversation around this whole subject of UFOs and blah 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 to keep the religious people happy or the religious interests and the corporate interests of course and which are all tied together as we're finding out more and more and and so on so it's i don't know well, all that stuff is just i just turned the other way i just like ah screw it you guys i'm i'm gone i'm on my own like i said i'm on my own <laughs> really well, but, but my you own. know the, the converse of that is when you find the meyer material you find something that it's like an endless it it's so deep. It's like going down this well and that you never come to the end of it. There's just volumes of information, volumes. It's like pulling back layers and layers of an onion. They, it just keeps going. And it, yeah, it gives well, you this whole understanding of things that is so much bigger than you mm-hmm. ever thought possible. And then you go through the phase of, oh, okay, now how am I going to tell people about this? Yeah, Which, yeah is a whole other thing. And I think it all comes down to the personal responsibility again, where every personality has to figure out what their niche is and yeah. what they were yeah. supposed to do with this. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm just, I'm just agreeing with you. It's, uh, again, it, it all comes down to doing your own work. I did my own work and uh, I can't, I can't really give that experience to anybody and say, well, yeah, I did this calculation before I found it. You know, and stuff like that. But, you know, the calculations are brain dead simple and they worked for me. And, but that's all I can say, you know, but people have to do their own work. And, uh, you know, that's as far as that can go. And it's interesting, you know, there's certain points that might be useful for people to digest or think about in terms of why they brought it public then and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, like it's just another piece of the puzzle, I guess. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, the Druins, these people we're talking about that live 3.1 million light years away uh, in this other galaxy, which is almost twice as big as ours, by the way, the Druins allegedly were urged in accordance with what they call the High Council to make themselves visible, to particularly to group members, to wow. group members in Switzerland. I didn't know if you, you probably have read that. I haven't read that. No, that's interesting. Yes, that's yes. Interesting. Uh, Billy, Billy first saw their ship at about eight uh, fourteen p.m. I don't remember what year this was. What year was this? This was nineteen eighty three. Yeah. And he said it was four to five times as large as Venus. At first, he thought it might have been Venus, but then he realized it wasn't Venus. It looked very bright. And it made all these strange shifts of color, and he uh-huh. saw, which permeated all the colors of the rainbow spectrum. He said, yeah. and that was he saw the this first time that structure. Was, yeah, he saw the structure in the sky. It didn't have a definite shape. It was constantly changing its form, and the color also slowly changed, fading into different shades. He said it was about 35,000 meters high at a distance 18 to 20 kilometers away. 
Now, he estimated the ship to be 340 meters in diameter, which is huge. Mm-hmm. This is a ship yeah. that's 1,000 a, a meters in diameter. Um, so it was just very and, – and this lady, this contact person, Talita, I like the way you pronounce her name. Her name <laughs> means one who walks through the rainbow, yeah, okay. which I – I have no idea why. It is very interesting. She recorded her speech using a tape recorder, which she then played in uh, presence of his group members. And this occurred in March 5th, 1983. There were 20 witnesses to this event. And wow. as I was saying earlier, Quetzal and Pata left Billy for a few months. There were some kind of decisions that had to be right. made in regard to the group members, and she was kind of uh, left behind. She described the the spaceship of the Druins. Uh, she said they were very far developed, extremely peaceful human beings. They had their own interesting innovations with technology. Their galaxy was about 1.7 times the size of ours and uh, about 3.1 million light years away. So um I mean, this is really interesting stuff man. I'm 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 so glad we had the the chance to kind of chat a little bit about this. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've certainly done more research about Toledo than I have. I must admit that's it is interesting. I uh I, I knew that there was something that t- going on there with uh, when they left for a while and Quetzal and Pata left. Um and uh but I didn't know anything really beyond that. I, I guess I haven't read all the contacts yet, but uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> or maybe well, I didn't. What's, I just interesting. Forget. what's interesting is um, they had a lot of uproar in the Figo group. And I think for some reason those people seem to be under a lot of pressure. Um, how many times have you been to Switzerland, by the way? Oh, three or four times now, I think. Three or four times? Maybe. Yeah, I think one time I went to Switzerland. I didn't go to the center, though. And uh, Actually, I might have gone five times now. Yeah, five times. Five yeah. times. Because I went My twice in one summer at one point. <laughs> so, but yeah. Did you did you say you had contact with Marianne Eulinger? I don't pronounce her name right, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, uh, what a nice lady. Very nice lady. Very intelligent lady, too. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. And, yeah, and she knows the Meyer material pretty darn well. Yes, she does. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you meet yeah. her? Did Did you get to meet her? Yeah, I met her this last time I went. Uh, we had been in contact uh, just over email um, for a while before that. I had some questions for her specifically, actually, and uh, and so we got in contact, and uh, and then uh, yeah, I got to see her at the center with her husband and. And she would come almost every day just to say hi, and then we'd go out and do stuff after the after the work day and stuff like that. So it was very enjoyable. <laughs> so, so when you're at the center, are you mostly working the whole time there? No, I, definitely not. Not most of the time at all. It's I think it's about like I I think we start at like ten in the in the morning, and then we have like an hour break or something, and at noon, and then another break in the afternoon, and then we stop at five. So it's like it's not even like six hours of work. So, but it's very enjoyable, and like you get to talk with the people there, and and that sort of thing while you're working, and it's just a beautiful, peaceful place, and working with nature, with the trees, and all the stuff that you know, the plants and the gardens and stuff. I mean, that's a very peaceful thing to do. So <laughs> it's not, it doesn't feel like work at all. I don't know. So what it kind of stuff like were you doing? Were you, were you putting fertilizer down, or what were you doing? <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but uh, no, just just uh, odd jobs here and there. I mean, you know, like I say, working in the garden a little bit and and uh, spreading gravel around on the on the on the uh, the driveway and stuff like that with a bunch of people, a bunch of guys there. And you know, Jacobus has his tractor and he likes to play with his big toys, and it's very enjoyable, you know, to work with everyone there. And and uh, so whenever Jacobus brings out his big tractor, we know that. He's going to be hauling stuff around, and we're going to be working with him a little bit on this and that, or whatever it might be, and, and stuff like that. So, but uh, I don't know. Uh, let me so ask you, always let, 
let me ask you this. Uh, Jacobus, now I could be incorrect about this. Do you remember when, when Simyasi fell and she, she hit her head and she had the, uh, the, the brain damage? Yes. Was yes, it I Jacobus, the one that walked into the room that startled her? I, yes, yes, it was, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Now, have yeah, but, have you yeah. been able to sit down and talk with him about any of the contacts or anything? Because I'm sure he's seen things. Well, with my shaky German, it's it's a little tough. He doesn't speak English hardly at all. But um, now, most of the time, we just talk about everyday things too. And you know, I he he was really into leather and all kinds of stuff like that. And like not, I know what you're thinking. That's not gonna, not the kind of leather I'm talking about. But um, <laughs> I, I tan leather for a living. So we he's he's into gun holsters and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, they're they're gun nuts in Switzerland. So. <laughs> So, well, that's um, interesting too. That's very interesting yeah. because Switzerland is is the one country that really emphasizes the right to bear arms, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And they all the men have to go into the army for was it two years or a year or two years, something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. they all have very like the reason I think they have a a stronger a stronger democracy than most countries. Like it makes count even Canada quite envious because they actually get to have referendums every, what is it, every few months anyway, on, on issues instead of just voting for another idiot. Um, <laughs> these these people actually have a very strong sense of personal ownership of their country. It feels to me, even on, on a very personal basis, even with young people. And um, right. I don't see that. I don't see that in Canada. I don't see that anywhere else. Even in Germany, I don't see that. And so on in France, or you know, like Switzerland is actually quite a unique country. And uh, if anybody really wants to um, to see what you know that kind of culture really is, I highly recommend it because it kind of gives you a boost <laughs> in terms of your faith in mankind, you know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, when we were we were texting back and forth on Skype, we talked a little bit about the political situation in the United States. And it looks very much like we're we are heading to the world that's described in the Hanok prophecies. And I, th- I believe I've heard Hillary Clinton state that if she's president, then she will go to war against Russia and Syria, ah. and that she's w- willing willing to use nuclear weapons. So we're quickly ah. descending into these ghastly things that are described in the Hanok prophecies. Yes. Can you comment? Yeah. Yes, yes, I know. I've been paying very close to attention to WikiLeaks lately, and uh, of course the whole situation in Russia with uh, Syria and what they've been trying to do there, and what they've, what everyone's been discovering about what the U.S. has been doing and so on too, which is not exactly positive. But that's maybe another story <laughs> for another time. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, no, I I cringe every time I think about it, and a lot of people do. I think there's a lot of you know, actually, it was very, very positive for me to see how many Bernie Sanders supporters there was. It actually is a very good thing to see because it tells you that most of the people in America are actually good people. Yeah. And that that actually, you know, gave me a bit of, you know, a bit of a, a shift in terms of, yeah, you know what? They're not all jerks over there. <laughs> so. You know, no, but our it, government it, is so evil. Our government oh. is so evil. It's, it's gotten it, it's so far. It's you know we were talking about that film that they have now out now. I guess it's somebody from the DNC, and I don't know. They're putting blood on the walls, and they're trying to conjure up evil spirits and. And that's the that's the guy who's running the freaking uh, the, the 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 no what is it the Democratic Party uh, yeah what's it um, the whole thing for their part of the vote whatever it's called <laughs> their part of the yeah uh, anyway I did the, delete the chairman. that link by the way I did not I I did not watch it all I couldn't watch it all uh, it was too yeah, weird and didn't. strange I don't think it's yeah, healthy. Well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Weird witchcraft. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, you know, there's a there's a point there. It's just a bit, yeah. 
I think they're just trying to be weird, and to them, that's like their version of spirituality or something. I don't know, whatever. And just because it's weird, it must be spiritual. But uh, I don't know. It's just. Yep. It, it, yeah. We've got just a few closing minutes here. Do you have any websites or anything like that? That you or anything no, you want to plug? You don't have anything to plug? No. Okay. No, nothing at all. I'm uh, well, I'm just an individual. <laughs> um, uh, now, what do you think about the Talmud of Emmanuel? Do you do you think that it will become more popular in the future? Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of people already sort of interpret the Bible in that way. You know, when you talk to people, um, Christians, a lot of Christians these days sort of leave out a lot of negative crap and interpret sort of the word, in quote, God, as sort of the universal consciousness and all this kind of stuff. So people are kind of moving in that direction anyway, in many respects. I mean, not everybody, of course. There's a lot of exceptions to that rule, but but um, very colorful people. Um, but, you know, like, it's... I can see that there's a shift going on there, and I think it's healthy, and eventually people will kind of remove the stigma. I think when we're all, by the time we're all flying in flying saucers and stuff in our own world, people want to <laughs> get rid of yeah. all of that stigma that goes on with this UFO thing. So but I think it won't be so, so much of a problem at that point for people to to see this case for what it is, you know, and, and um, you know, this, this, I was very impressed with James Deardorff um, and his analysis of the Talmud. And actually, he mm-hmm. used very similar, similar um, techniques that I used for my for my calculations. It was all probability, and we know you know he actually explains it in his book how it works too. And I, I just kind of figured this out on my own that when you put something, take something that has a very high probability of being true and put it together with something else that has a very high probability of being true, and if they support each other then the probability skyrockets. So you're not you're no longer talking about 95% accuracy. You're talking about 99.999%. And then when you add other things and it all fits together, you know, then yeah, you're kind of by the by the end of his book, I think the probability was 1 in 10 to the power of 111, which is of uh, that would be the the chance that this book could not be hoaxed, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, that's a bigger number than there are atoms on this planet. So I think, um, <laughs> wow. yeah, I, it's a very interesting thing that you can do with probability. And you don't need an expert anymore. You can do it yourself. And that's the point. You know, that's why they wanted to bring it out while the computer age is getting started. Now everyone has personal computers. Everyone does. Not just governments, you know, with their, you know, uh, access to their military spending or whatever like that. Now, everyone has them. You know, everyone can look at Google Earth. Everyone can look at, you know, all these different things and figure things out for themselves. You know, they can do their own measurements. So no longer is the opinion of an expert necessary. <laughs> that's the beauty of it. So I think that's the whole well, Daniel, point of this case. It's been a pleasure chatting with you this evening, and I hope... Uh, we can get you back on the show in the future, sir. It's been a real pleasure. Have, have a great evening. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, yeah, you too. And uh, we'll, we'll talk for sure some more. <laughs> All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night.